Welcome, everyone. My name is Clayton Kraft. I'm with Egalia. This is the Let's Talk About Co-ops panel. Um, here I have seven folks who, uh, some of them have presented on their co-ops earlier today in this track. Um, the way this is structured is uh, I have a few prepared questions we'll start off with. And then after that, I'll open it up for uh, folks in the audience if you have any questions, like specifically about co-ops in general, or uh, if you want to ask anyone here any more details, maybe about what they talked about in their, their talk or, or anything else um, related to co-ops. So first off, um, I would like everyone on the panel to just do a quick introduction, uh, who you are, uh, the size of the co-op that you are a member of, and how long uh, the co-op has been around and how long you've been involved in the, the co-op. All right, we'll start on this end and move down. Okay, hi everyone. Um, I am Valerie Young, she, her pronouns. I work at Egalia. It's a 140 person cooperative and uh, I've worked there two years, but it's been around for 21 years, 22. So I'm Denver Gingrich. I use he, him pronouns. Um, uh, while I do work at Software Freedom Conservancy, uh, I also work at a cooperative called MBOA Technology Cooperative Inc. Um, which is the home for JMP and other projects like it. Um, while we started in uh, 2017 as a sole proprietorship, uh, we're now a cooperative as of this past September, um, and we have uh, five members, uh, uh, sorry, five employees, four members. I'm uh, Watson with uh, a Volt Cooperative, Austin, Texas, uh, developer for 30 years now, over 30 years. Um, uh, can you hear me? What's this? Can you, can you hear me now? Okay, there we go. Yeah, yeah developer for like 30 years uh, with a cooperative that's a uh, uh, Volt Cooperative that started in 2012, so past, um, you know, 12 years or so. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Aaron Wolf. I am the a co-founder of Snowdrift.coop, which is a platform co-op of sorts fundraiser uh, fundraising system that is still struggling to actually get the co-op system totally functioning. So this is a I'm here sort of on a, a co-op struggle uh, challenges of starting a co-op <laughs> perspective, but we've actually been working on it for ten years with all sorts of challenges, and um, that's. hear me all right? Closer? Can you hear me now? All right, <laughs> thank you. My name's Keegan Rankin. I am a worker owner of Agaric Technology Collective, and Agaric has been around since 2006, 2007, depending on when you count, <laughs> uh, whether or not you're talking about legal or just, anyway, different. There are different <laughs> uh, pot potential uh, starting dates, but I've been a worker owner uh, for, uh, I, I think, since uh, fall of 2021. And um, I guess that's all I have to say. Um, feel free to choose pronouns, so. <laughs> Hi, I'm Dan Furry. Uh, I am a member of Interstitial Co-op, uh, which is a worker-owned and democratically controlled co-op. Uh, it's been around about three years now. I've been involved two years. Um, we're a little strange in that we have um, we're multi multiple disciplinary disciplines. Uh, we have uh, software uh, engineering, uh, some designers, a lot of hardware engineers as well. Um, oh, but we're only like 13 or 15 of us right now. Um, I'm I'm actually mechanical, chemical engineering trained. Uh, I'm Joel Brock. I'm Joel. I'm a um, founding member and board president of the Tech Support Co-op. Um, we incorporated in 2014 here in the state of Oregon, and um, we have members in the U.S. and Canada. There's six of us. Um, two of our members are in Canada, so we get to call ourselves international. 
Is that all the questions? Yeah, I think that's it. Yeah. <laughs> all right, welcome. So thinking back on uh, the history of your co-op, whether it's uh, long or short, um, how does your co-op evaluate itself? I assume there's some sort of like internal evaluation that happens. And when there are problems found, how do you uh, course correct or you know solve those problems in a constructive way so you don't crater your organization? And that's just an open question for anyone on the panel who would like to respond. Well, I can I can start. Um, uh, I about the self evaluation and course correction um, at Agalia, which has you know been around for a while, and there's a lot of us. Um, I think that it happens in two ways. One way is that it's very it's a culture of bringing up issues as, as um, they are noticed. Um, which is very necessary. But there are also some structural elements. Uh, so, you know, we're really big, and to actually surface all problems uh, or, or make sure people are comfortable solving, surfacing problems, we do do a 360 survey once per year. And people in the support team, which is the company wide work, um, they go through this survey and try to pick out the issues that seem uh, common enough. Uh, and then there's usually a follow-up discussion at an assembly forum, and then out of that, a small group might come up with a proposal and work on, uh, hopefully, a solution to that problem. Um, but that's, that's just one kind of, or those are two things. I mean, I feel like this is something that has to be cultural in a co-op, that you do do this introspection, but, but also structural to some amount, because you need to make time for that in introspection. Awesome. Anyone else have a... Response. Yeah, go ahead. It's uh, it's not easy to necessarily answer the question like entirely directly, but I'll do my best um, <laughs> because um, I think some of the opportunities that I've been finding for um, taking on that kind of introspection have been um, one um, practice that Agaric has done for several years, and and I've been trying to make sure that we do that practice a little bit more than we have been actually in the past couple of years. Is have like one on ones with each other which is, um, I don't know how that would go in a co-op as it scales up, it might still work really well, but we're a small co-op, you know, so just trying to make sure that we have, you know, I get to talk with each other person in the co-op every now and then, and, and that, you know, can just get a pulse on, like, how the individuals are doing and how things are going, but also um, sometimes I think those open up good opportunities for having more introspection and more, you know, questioning of, like, how are, how are things actually going and what ideas do we have to, you know, ch um, uh, you know, I guess identify and do something about any of our pain points. And then the only other thing that I'll mention here is um, when it comes to actually, you know, going about affecting those changes, we'll typically just have, you know, we'll, someone will call a worker owner meeting, which will just be, you know, we need to put it on the agenda and say, hey, let's get that to happen this upcoming Tuesday and we'll talk about whatever issue and, and that's, Typically, at that point, we're, that's when we're trying to set up a worker owner meeting, meeting, it's for when we have something to vote on. Just as a quick follow-up, because it's fun, we do the same thing at Agalia. We do have randomly assigned one-to-one -one meetings with other Agalians in the company, because there's 140 and we're remote. And you're right, it's, it's very important to have space for um, not specific project or problem-solving conversations between employees. So it's fun that you do that. That's at six people, and we do it at 140. Uh, I'll go ahead and just mention that uh, we have found it very effective to have an explicit uh, review and appreciations at the end of whatever interactions we have. So when we have meetings, we actually have a, uh, at the end of the meeting, just a quick going around in a circle and saying, uh, what do you appreciate about how things that went well during this meeting? and any concerns or constrictions you have, you know, tensions about the, this exact session we just did. And we're sort of always iterating how we do meetings. So somebody will say, I really appreciated this time that we took to, you know, the facilitation gave some space for people to have back and forth without interrupting. That was really helpful this time. Thank you. Or um, I felt like we could use some more time, you know, uh, warning before the end of the thing because we felt kind of rushed or whatever it is. And then we figure out how to adjust the plan for the next meeting so that we're always improving how we efficiently and you know, communicate in, the, in meetings that we have. 
Yeah, it's awesome. That's, That's a good great. idea. <clears throat> At Volk, we have uh, uh, we do like the uh, the Richard Wolf method on Fridays. We basically are doing governance and and working on the business, and uh, we essentially we use Robert's rules uh, to have our discussion. Someone does a proposal, and we go around. Um, so two minutes, do the proposal, and then response uh, once or twice. Uh, myself, you know, somebody I know that somebody has a viewpoint and they're not bringing it up, I'll, even if I disagree with it, I'll take it on and try to defend it um, and put it out there so things are, um, yeah, so everything's out in the open. Um, so we're, uh, if you, we allow people to come in and see our meetings, people who aren't part of the cooperative, um, so they can be familiar with cooperatives and whatever. And it's, it, there's some things rarely we might not bring up, uh, but you know, it's it can from the outside it looks pretty adversarial. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'll, I'll tack on just because you brought Watson because you brought up the decision making process uh, at, at the tech support co-op. Uh, you know, my my initial answer to your question is like. Not much. We don't do much to self-evaluate. Um, we have like we we evaluate clients periodically. We'll send out surveys and we'll always send. We'll always try and get feedback when we lose a client. Um, and we have like an annual strategic planning process that does involve like us all working together on not work stuff. But primarily, I think it's our it's our culture by virtue of operating on consensus in our particular co-op. Um, that we, things can't, things come up like in that process. Like you can't move things forward if you're not really putting everything on the table. And so that's sort of how it shows up for us is people just have to show up and be forthright. Like we don't have like a sit down or a buddy system or anything. It's just like, hey, I have a problem with what you just said and here's why. And now we have to walk, now we have to work through this before we can move this proposal forward. Um, and so that's what we're going to do, and, and that's kind of that's our that's our process, and it's part of our culture, but it's not really formalized. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, I'll just um, say that we're we're kind of similar. I mean, we're a fairly small, like five uh, total people in the organization, and so um, uh, so yeah, we uh, we use the consensus model, um, and and usually uh, we can uh, reach agreement. Um, and, and yeah, it, it can be um, a little bit ad hoc. Like we're usually in um, um, in the same mumble chat room the whole day. So it's kind of like, you know, a bit of water cooler, a bit of like uh, regular chat, a bit of, you know, in, intense discussion sometimes. Um, and uh, yeah, that's kind of how we run things. And then um, uh, or, or often handle the um, disagreements and then in, um, um, kind of more formally, we have a, a meeting every every month, uh, which we uh, call like a, a retrospective or, or something, and then we'll do like, um, and it's it's you know, uh, not and and again not so much self evaluation, um, but uh, maybe more toward the business, but does help us reflect on how well we're operating um, and ask questions like what should we do more, what should we do less, what should we keep doing, uh, those sorts of kind of uh, uh, standard things. And so, so yeah, um, that's, that's how we sort of do things. Um, and it, it's interesting to hear from, you know, larger cooperatives, of course, because, um, uh, uh, yeah, it, we're, it hope to grow, of course. And, um, and yeah, it's, it's neat to hear. I guess um, also just to, to, for some details, we are um, um, worker um, owned and operated, um, just to fill in the blanks. And we also um, incorporated in, uh, in Ontario, Canada, and we have uh, four people in, in Canada and one in the U.S. Um, so, yeah, that's us. Nice, nice. So you're international as well. Yes, <laughs> that's right, we are. Great. So um, has there been a time when something, like, drastic has changed, whether it's, uh, like, the market changes or some external pressure, or maybe you're um, a source of funding is at risk and, and you've had to make quick drastic changes within your co-op um, and if so how did it go and anything you want to share about that yes 
Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I mean, um, so um, our, our co-op, we work primarily with retail food businesses, natural food retailers, largely co-ops. And so when pandemic happened, um, that changed a lot of things that were happening in the grocery stores. Um, and like a lot, like everything about the way people bought groceries changed. And uh, we, we definitely had to be there to adapt. Luckily, we were pretty well positioned. We'd had some, we'd already had built out a bunch of um, e-commerce uh, plugins. So we were kind of ready to go with some of the, you know, we had a Mercado thing ready. We had a, like a WordPress plugin ready, you know, so we were pretty well situated. Um, but the other thing that happened too was people stopped opening grocery stores. And that's a big chunk of our customers is small startup stores. And so that hurt. And um, sort of by accident, we, we took on a new member um, this was before the pandemic hit, but not long before, but he brought in with him uh, like his little pet project, not little, it's it's incredible, but um, this like Python framework that he built that he uses in his clients to just integrate anything within the internal, s it's it's crazy, but he, he can tie together just the weirdest systems that shouldn't talk to each other. Um, so we found uses for this in our grocery clients um, and we were able to come to them with um, a new offering that was valuable to them that like immediately we were just like, we could just deploy a server in their store and start you know, telling the alarm system what the temperature co control system was doing and all this other stuff that, that our clients thought was just super. <laughs> that, that was by accident, we didn't plan that. <laughs> I'll, I'll say something and follow to that because I still think that there's sort of something funly co-op-y about that, which is just that a lot of solutions come from anyone in the company. Um, and at Agalia, there's two times when I think very suddenly the company lost a ton of income. Um, but both times, uh, the company was really able to quickly, uh, you know, based on the diverse and interests of the uh, people working there find new areas of work and um, recover pretty quickly without ever having to fire anyone um, in ways that uh, they saw. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, and, and th this was like, you know, the first uh, tech crisis or economic crisis a while ago. They saw other consultancies fail, but Egalia didn't, I think, in part because of the flexibility of the model. That's huge. Cool. Anyone else? Um, <clears throat> we basically the same story. Two thousand eight came through, and uh, you know, there's a, a cut in budgets from customers and stuff like that. And we just basically everybody across the board took a, a pay cut until it was over. Cool. I, th I think there might be a question there. Uh, yeah. Um, or hold the questions till. Until we're finished here, and then uh, we'll just have folks come up and ask away like crazy. <laughs> if you can hold on just a moment. Thanks. Um, so, uh, has there been an unsolved problem that currently exists in your co op that uh, you know, you're still trying to figure out? Um, you don't have to get like super specific if it's you know, sensitive or whatever, but, but yeah, any, any co op y type problems you've had to um, look at that are currently unsolved that you want to share about? I guess I will go ahead because we have probably the most of those. Um, <laughs> we are trying to build a international, much larger scale patron type of co-op in which people who are funding public goods get to be the members who have democratic say. And we actually do not have some sort of equity that we can have in a sense that a lot of worker co-ops could have in terms of the ownership of this and one of the features is that we are in that sense are not focused on profit and even profit in the sense that a worker co-op would be focused on profit so we went through the process of incorporating in the state of Michigan which happens to have uh, allow the idea of being a chartered cooperative in terms of having co-op in the name and be under a non-profit law and in terms of talking about what that means and how that relates to the governance 
uh, has been a, a big challenge, but the, the issue essentially is how to build a robust enough system for a lot of people who are not so active, because it's not their day job to constantly be involved in this, how to build all of the accessible types of mechanisms that, um, that we need for people to be engaged with governance and vote and whatever. And at some level, we're talking about like, I guess we got ourselves into what it means to run a, a democracy, like, you know, at the level of a small state or something, which is ludicrous. And so uh, how to write that into the bylaws and have that type of decision on, on how to run a co-op of that scale uh, with people who are not engaged day to day, which I guess in some levels isn't that different from maybe a credit union, where most of the people at the credit union are in fact members and near zero of them even know that there's anything to vote on and don't even know that board meetings happen. And credit unions seem to have just completely given up on the idea that their members are anything other than client, you know, customers at a bank that might as well just be a regular bank, uh, even though they're supposed to be a, a co-op. And we're trying to avoid that. And um, yeah, so we, we have a lot of things to discuss about that. And it's uh, not a something we've solved where I can say, here's the solution to all of that. Yeah, we feel, we feel that um, issue pretty strongly at Interstitial as well, um, being um, most of the members are not getting their full-time work through the co-op or through for their full-time income. Um, I, think, uh, I think of uh, co-ops as a place we want to bridge to in the world. Like most people have their, their usual non-co-op job. And um, yeah, curious about... Um, how to uh, engage those members that are part-time um, in a way that has, in a, a sustaining, like, uh, energetic way that they're, they're participating. Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a big thing for us. Go ahead, Joel, I see you raising your hand. Well, I, I don't know if this is the time to try and answer the question, but. Sure. Go ahead, yeah. I mean, <laughs> it, what jumps to mind is a multi-stakeholder model where you've defined very multiple classes of memberships. Um, and that can look like totally different things for every level. So you could have workers, worker owners at a certain level, a certain economic investment, certain um, hours investment, whatever. Um, you could have sort of peripheral participants at a different level, and the expectations on them are different. Um, but of course, it's a co-op, so we still have democratic member control at the core. So all of those people are members in full with equal say and voice. But you get to you get to kind of lay out what what involvement looks like for them, um, and that would just be part of your bylaws or some sort of policy document. Yeah, yeah I want to put this off till a later discussion, but just to clarify, um, on a on a simple level, there's a question. This goes from the platform co-op movement as a whole, there's this general dynamic of how do you do these things asynchronously over the internet when you're just uh, not in the sense of, yeah, people can be remote, that's one thing, but if people are even in different time zones or, um, but it, again, larger scale, the issue is uh, also a free software one in that we literally want tools that are good enough for the general public to be using to engage with the co-op, and I don't think the tooling is ideal at the moment. So we're we're messing, you know dealing with that from the free software, bringing it that into the platform co-op direction. Thanks. All right, cool. Um, so before I open it up to questions from the audience, uh, I wanted to give the panelists an opportunity to ask any questions you might have for other panelists. Oh, I guess I guess maybe quickly. I think we've heard from some um, uh, some panelists where their cooperative is incorporated, but maybe if others who who haven't mentioned it can just just so we know, because I, I in our research it was quite different even between provinces um, in Canada. So I, I'm curious where others are incorporated. 
Well, I'll answer very briefly because I don't know the answer um, because the galley is so big and complicated. But uh, I mean, we are incorporated in Spain, but not as a cooperative. It's one of those situations where we kind of take the way that we've incorporated it and incorporated and hacked it to mean a cooperative by saying things like, you know, the president's not actually in charge, the workers all have votes and stuff like that. But we have to have a president because it's a requirement as you know, so it's just like a rotating random title. I don't even know who's the president right now in Agalia. Um, sure. Um, I guess Agaric is incorporated in Massachusetts, and it's also the case that we are not incorporated as a cooperative um, by state law. We are actually an LLC, and we're a cooperative by our bylaws, and I think that um, tends to be advantageous for us just because, uh, well, again, things get really complicated, but part of it is that some of our worker owners are also international, and so on paper, technically, they are um, contractors, right? But, um, but in terms of op operationally, they're also entitled to the one-person, one-vote system, so in, for all intents and purposes, they're... <laughs> worker owners um, and treated exactly the same as everyone else. And that just makes things a little bit easier on paper. And I don't think we really care that much about what the state thinks about us anyway. So. <laughs> <laughs> do you do patronage dividends in your co-op? Uh, yeah, we do. Okay, maybe that's a good question for everybody. Yeah, could you repeat that? I didn't catch it. Oh, I was curious if, if not being incorporated as a co-op meant you but it seems like you're still able to pay out your pay. My question was just about patronage dividends in a. Does anyone know what a patronage dividend is? I don't even know yeah, what is that. <laughs> Great. Um, please go on. <laughs> Tell us more. <laughs> well, this is one of the big reasons to even form a co op. Um, so. Are you talking about profit sharing? No. Oh. Um, so. Sort of. So I'm not an accountant, but. Um, as one of the benefits of being a cooperative is that you can write off taxes on your profits if you distribute those profits back into the membership. It's still not profit sharing, but it's, um, it's patronage based, which means how much you used the co-op. Um, so if you're a member of REI and you shop there, they send you a little check at the end of the year or something, that's your patronage dividend. Um, and same thing if you have a food co-op that gets, you know, you get the same thing. Um, so uh, in our co-op, uh, it could be, yep. Yeah. Or in our case, you could have an arcane formula that makes zero sense that calculates your <laughs> year-end patronage. But yeah, okay, absolutely. Wow. Um, so that's uh, oh yeah, and then and then the, the tax benefit, of course, you get to you get to write off most of uh, eighty percent of your profits if you distribute that to the members, um, and you can distribute it by putting it in a account in their name and not giving the members cash. And you would do that. that the, the reason you would do that is if you were actually tr taking on debt or trying to do an expansion or something. And you could then invest your own equity back into the co-op and use that to do big projects and stuff. Um, and so in some years, members might be like, yeah, I'm fine not taking a dividend. Um, so we can get this thing off the ground. And, um, and then it'll get paid out later. And like everything is being saved in people's names. So if you don't get paid out one year, you might get paid out three years the next time or something. So that was not clear. Interstitial does something similar. Um, surplus at the end of the year distributed as uh, a patronage by hours. Hours worked, uh, even though uh, different workers uh, bill at different rates with different projects. There's a bit of a redistribution. Um, aspect there um, and yeah other that that surplus also get like likewise we can keep some of that surplus to fund various projects um, and um, not receive the dividend at the end of the year um, we are incorporated in Colorado um, not a specific reason that I know of I really like the idea of LLC and just using the uh, the bylaws to um, structure the cooperative. Um, it seems like there's a nice flexibility there that I'd be curious about. Both, did you say? What both was? 
Yeah, we're here. Yeah, we're an LLC, but we also individual members have the option to be tied to the LLC with their own entity, so we can do something where essentially the distribution for the tax is a whole lot more beneficial than doing the profit sharing. So we're very uh, tax sensitive. I have a question for a couple of you. I mean, I, let's see. Uh, in uh, Ag Algaric's talk, I think someone mentioned that um, the goal was not growth like Agalia, um, which, you know, it's very strange. I don't even know why we've grown this far. I think it's just because we keep having business and we our model keeps scaling, so we keep growing. Um, maybe a, a Galleon who's been longer could tell more of the history of that. But I was curious then why co-ops that have been smaller for a long time have stayed so small? Is like what was the was there intention behind it, and if so, why? Or like what what makes you not want to grow? Um, sure. I mean, I think uh, that this has been the way Garrick has been for a long time. But I I wish I could remember uh, which philosopher. Um, had said this, and maybe there's someone on this board who could remember because there's some really well-read people on this board here, but um, I can't remember who it was, but they said something, they're like, like a big part of their framework was there is a, um, you know, a lot of people talk about things that are too small, there's a lot of things that are too big, and then there's some things that are just right, <laughs> you know, and, uh, you know, it's kind of like the Goldilocks thing, right, but, um, <laughs> But yeah, I think I think there's um, for us, you know, it makes sense to kind of stay at a size where um, it's like if we got too big, then we would need to think a lot more about, you know, how democracy scales. And and it's not that we're not interested in those questions; they're just very complicated questions. And we're just trying to operate, you know, at, at a small level and where it's just easier <laughs> for us, basically. And I'm sure there are a ton of other reasons, but. Um, but in terms of just, you know, keeping a system of trust, um, it just uh, feels a little bit easier to operate. We're a small team, and, you know, when one person is, you know, experiencing some, some kind of difficulty with something that they're working on, then we have the opportunity to, you know, and you can reach out to anyone in the co-op, and maybe that's true at larger co-ops as well. I don't want to say that that's not true, but this is just, um, at least my experience and, and I guess some of the maybe not entirely well thought out reasons why this is an ad hoc response to that question. Yeah, yeah <laughs> great. Very interesting. Did anyone else want to? No more questions. Uh, we, uh, uh, and I myself and the rest of us, we're uh, at bulk. We're kind of more passionate about having other people start uh, cooperatives. So we've We've helped other people uh, spin off one in New Zealand and another one in Dallas, we're in Austin. Um, that's kind of what, what I'm passionate about. So I'd, I'd rather stay a bit smaller and then it, it aligns with the level of risk averseness that we, we are and uh, help other, even if it were that we started and paid for the, you know, the structure and everything else and to have other people join it and then help them. I'd rather do something like that and, and then see what blooms over there. Cool. Right, any more questions from folks on the panel? I got one. Um, I have a question about compliments, uh, how we can complement each other and um, bartering. You know, it seems like, you know, the whole uh, cooperatives should help each other. I mean, we say it, but I was wondering, uh, for you all, did you ever uh, say barter with any of the any of the companies that you um, did the uh, give them the POS system? And it's for anyone else. Well, you know, just to, I mean, I like your hat. Just, just starting off with a comp <laughs> just starting off with a compliment. Um, is that not the compliment you meant? <laughs> you mean? No, that's good enough. <laughs> um, 
No, no, we've never uh, bartered for a point of sale system. No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, yeah, I mean, I don't know. Like, we've had plenty of free labor yeah. Yeah. from the community at large that's been involved. Um, but I don't know that they got anything out of it, so I couldn't call it a barter. Uh, they got that w the warm, fuzzy feelings, you know. Well, I'll, I'll say briefly, the, just as an idealistic organization that probably uh, gets way too far in this direction to scope creep and whatever else, uh, we went and decided that we had to figure out the most ideal banking, and we signed up for the National Cooperative Bank as our initial yeah. uh, bank, and I do not recommend them because the online system was absolutely <laughs> horrific, where uh, every few weeks I would get prompted that I had to change not only the password, but the random like questions you're supposed to ask of the 12 things of like, who's your, you know, what, who was your favorite cat or whatever it was. And, and if I answered the same questions again, it wouldn't allow them, they had to be new. <laughs> and then the system would kick me out of the system and I ended up having to like leave. And this is a software thing again, where uh, cooperatives need to understand uh, and use free software. And there needs to be a lot more <laughs> communication between the both uh, cooperatives need to talk to cooperatives and cooperatives need to talk to the free software movement. Uh, so anyway, uh, we made some effort. <laughs> I'll say um, I n I'm, I'm sure that Agaric has participated in some bartering, and I am just racking my brain trying to think of, of uh, times that it's occurred. Um, this isn't exactly barter, but more just, uh, you know, I think there are, it's often that we have sort of just um, relationships where value gets, um, just, you know, positive relationships where value just kind of gets transferred back and forth. and for different circumstances. I know a friend of ours, um, Martin Owens, is an Inkscape artist, and he does a lot of logos and things, and uh, I, he does a podcast as well. And, uh, you know, for a while we've supported his podcast, and it's sometimes we'll reach out to him uh, if we need, like, logo work or, um, or maybe just, like, yeah, I, I guess that's really, really the main reason we would reach out to him if, if, you know, someone needs a certain, like, a new logo or something, something updated. Um, and there's just, um, that's a situation anywhere where there's just some really good faith, um, like, transactions that are occurring that aren't necessarily, like, you know, I'll pay you for this or I'll pay you for that. And I know that um, if Martin needed something from us, you know, it would be the same thing. We'd be happy to try to help with whatever projects he has going on. I'll, I'll add just on the bartering thing, it's a good in impulse. I think the real question was how well are cooperative organizations really doing business with each other? Uh, but it does happen to be that our co-op lawyer who helped us get incorporated is now taking uh, music lessons with me and we bartered for <laughs> legal stuff and music lessons. Full circle. <laughs> nice. I'm Thanks. also, um, I don't know if something like this exists, but uh, I'm also interested if there's a place where co-ops can sort of compare notes or, uh, you know, maybe express a certain problem you have and like how you run your business or, or, or whatever. And maybe other co-ops could be like, yeah, we've had this problem, here's the tools, or like how, here's how we've approached that or, or whatever. Um, yeah, I don't know if anything like that exists today. I'm personally, I'm somewhat of a co-op newbie, so I might just be unaware of something, but. Uh, we're in a, it's a Slack, I think. No, maybe not a Slack, I don't know. I can't remember, because I only signed on once. But there is this tech co-op a uh, group that some people at Agalia are on, and um, I should look that up and share it with the other presenters There's here. There's a bunch of lists and boards and various things, yeah. and in none of it's very well organized. Um, I try to join all of them, but there's like a Yahoo group, and there's like a, um, there is a Slack for the US Federation of Worker Co-ops. There was, a little while ago, there was a pretty well-organized effort to get the tech co-ops all together in a network. We even had a website, um, but that's gone now. Uh, <laughs> um, so, th there, but there, there's email lists and things. It's just not, it's not terribly cohesive. So I think, yeah, there's probably some improvement that could be done there. Uh, 
just to, to mention logistically, um, I, I can't promise this per se, but uh, we could probably set up Mattermost uh, if people want to use XMPP or their standard protocols um, to use uh, with Slack. That'd be cool. Uh, I want to mention that uh, the uh, social.coop is a organization that I'm also a member of, which is a mass, runs a Mastodon instance as well as several other communication tools, is discussing other things. There's, I think there's 300, maybe 500 members. Um, and in that sense, it's um, a, a patron co-op. I mean, it's not a worker co-op again, um, but the, there are tools like Lumio that are used there, but it's also a place where a lot of people in the co-op world are. So it's both a place where people who are interested in cooperation and cooperatives communicate with each other, as well as people who just happen to be involved in it because they like the idea of being in a co-op in order to be on a Mastodon and other social sort of instances. And so there's a lot of co-op discussions and cross-pollination there. Hey, I have a real quick question. Uh, who on this panel uses Lumio for votes at their co-op? I'm just curious. Do we? Only a couple our, of us. Well, at social co-op, as I was mentioning. Yeah. Not our. OK, not everybody. Online, yeah. Anyway, Lumio is an uh, open source software voting or poll making application, and we use it at Egalia. And they're a co op too, right? Too. And they're yeah. a co op. Yeah. <laughs> so, co ops using co ops. So. <laughs> yeah. And they actually have some good documentation they put up about their whole co op yep. journey. There's a lot of good, like on their Lumio website, they've got some white papers and stuff they published that's really good. I guess two things. Um, on one, on the Lumio comment, um, I think as a smaller co op, there's less of a need for a solution there, right? Because we can just have a quick meeting and quickly talk and then just everyone say thumbs up or thumbs down. <laughs> you know, it's, a pre it's pretty fast, it's not a big problem. Um, and what was the question we were talking about before? I was gonna say something. Co-ops and using co-ops and co-ops interacting. Oh, yes, okay. Um, and I've talked with a couple people out, um, outside of talks here. Um, just to men I mentioned um, the, there's a, a international, um, cooperative tech co-op federation right now called patio and I don't want to go into what's going on with patio right now but one of the, I have seen there um, I think a couple instances of um, some people kind of doing like worker like exchange programs a little bit right and I think that would be something that I'd be interested in I mean I, I think that would be really cool to do myself I don't know how how easy it is to make happen right but just kind of uh, you know have a have some opportunity to, to like work in another co-op and just and to learn from other people about different ways of operating and um, you know I think one of the challenges that I f I feel as a part of a small cooperative is that there are you know we have um, I guess we have a few different we have several experts and I, Lewis and I here are um, you know kind of the younger developers here and just the access to their you know the our more senior level developers time is something that can be challenging right and sometimes I don't I feel like I don't have a full um, understanding something that's a, a long time to develop a full understanding of what a good development process really looks like and what a you know fully functioning team looks like and so just kind of being able to work in another co-op and around other people I feel like could be an opportunity for um, just seeing how other people do things. Cool. I like it. Okay, if there's no more questions from panel folks, also you can ask questions too if you think of them, but uh, I'd like to open the mic up for anyone in the audience who has a question. Uh, yeah. Mike, go ahead. Yeah, come up to the mic, because I think it's being recorded, if and so we want to... Or the mic can maybe go to you, but I think it's wired, so... Is it on? Maybe not. First off, thanks everyone for coming and doing this. This is a great panel. <laughs> um, my question is, are there any good resources for finding co-ops? Um, there were so many co-ops that were brought up during Joel's talk that I just had no idea were co-ops at all. Um, and so I'm wondering if there's any sort of registry or labeling that customers, potential future members, or simply interested people could find. Um, I'll maybe mention briefly, I think, I, I'm not sure of 
uh, personally of, of databases of, uh, of like software freedom co-ops or, or similar, um, uh, but generally um, in, in a lot of areas there's at least the, the list of all cooperatives um, in, in the province or, or the region um, if, they, if they're registered that way, but of course uh, a lot of them are not registered that way just as LLCs with cooperative bylaws. Um, so, so yeah, I, I, I'm not sure myself, um, but there are some big lists, uh, just I don't know about smaller lists. Yeah, there are, there are several, several directories. You could try like uh, identity.coop, which is the organization that um, maintains the, the dot co-op TLD. Did you, know, did you know we have our own top-level domain? Sponsored. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sponsored field. Wow. Um, and um, they have a directory. So that's, they have an international directory on their website. Um, in the US, like, I mean, it depends how big you want to go. Um, because there are, in fact, a lot of co-ops. Uh, the University of Wisconsin-Madison has um, a really thorough census um, with maps and everything. It's going to include the whole shebang, utility co-ops, um, consumer co-ops, education housing co-ops. Everything's on there. Um, tens of thousands of co-ops are on that list. But if you want something smaller, <laughs> um, there's also just like the tech co-op lists. It's that one on GitHub. On GitHub. Yeah, the yeah. HNG. We used that one to kind yeah. of reach out to some of y'all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because we, we didn't know we were looking around, you know. Yeah. That's, I think, pretty authoritative at this point, now that the, now that the tech co-op website is gone. I haven't checked this list, and it doesn't really answer your question 100%, because it's not, a, um, I'm not sure how complete it is, but at least this might be helpful for other co-ops. To think about, there's a website called find.coop or find.coop, however you want to say it. Right? What's that? Say co op, not coop. Say co op. Find.coop, yeah, it's Thank official. <laughs> sure. And, um, and what's that? I think you should do it in camel case. Camel case. <laughs> that could be cool. Um, and that I, I'm really ashamed that I can't remember the <laughs> the name of the project that has been trying to organize that. That website does need some work. Um, but the, some of the goals of the, the project and the, the individuals who are trying to work on that are working on uh, just like standardizing data um, within cooperatives and um, in many ways, but also in just like how we collect information about cooperatives. And I think it's a cool project and probably something that cooperatives should take a look at and they could use, they could use some attention and care. I think the comment there was uh, was ICA dot co op um, had had a wiki. Maybe it's in um, it the. Wiki, oh, okay. I see. Um, and it had um, a pro maybe you can find it on Internet Archive. Hopefully, um, uh, so so yeah. But apparently, it's uh, a bit less useful now. Um, but we'll see. Maybe it's there. Yeah, come on up. Are you familiar with if the National Co-op Bank is itself a co-op? Which? The National, National Co-op co Bank? Oh, the, the, I mentioned the National Cooperative Bank. The National Cooperative Bank is some weird story. It actually was chartered by the U.S. Congress, and it was related to providing a banking system for cooperative organizations as part of this push that goes back to some decades ago. and. Uh, then somehow became slightly less tied to the U.S. government and isn't officially a government something anymore. Um, and they tend to work with housing cooperatives, I think, as their sort of primary thing. But they, they basically are a, it's sort of like a credit union, but they happen to actually have co-op in the name. Um, and it is, in fact, some form of a cooperative, indeed, I, I believe. I mean, I'm, I'm glad you brought that, that up again. I, I was going to sort of 
maybe soften your earlier remark and say, if you need financing for your startup co-op, you should absolutely contact NCB, despite yeah. Aaron's frustrations with their user interface, which are understandable. I, 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 want the, I want the free software people to come and help them. I don't want to be <laughs> opposed to them. I just, the, the pro, there is a very big problem with co-ops outside of the tech world and even inside the tech world who don't understand software freedom at all. But NCB does amazing work, and they'll support your co-op. Yes. <laughs> and everybody I talked to there was nice, but they didn't fix the tech stuff. <laughs> Any more questions? Yeah, come on up. Uh, I wrote it down because I'm anxious about this, but I'm super into co-ops, yeah. and so I was on the board of this beer brewing co-op back in Austin, and so we have a cooperative business alliance that's a co-op. Volk is part of it. And so that you could check and see if you've got a local place like that. But um, we used to use this company called, they changed their name, but I found it. It's called columinate.coop. And they would have, yeah, that, those guys. And they have uh, a great great uh, training called C-Build 101 that really helps figure out and train you on like a lot of the nuts and bolts. But uh, besides like with Snowdrift, I was just curious if like with the beer brewing co-op in Texas, alcohol laws are real funny and it was a, it's still an ongoing nightmare for the co-op. And I was just curious if you guys had dealt with any like regulatory headaches uh, when creating your co-ops or, or man maintaining your co-ops, like hiring international or any of that stuff? I can uh, maybe talk briefly. Um, so it was a, a big thing when we started to make sure that we could have um, international members in our co-op. And, and I know it's, it's very different in a lot of areas and why a lot of people choose LLCs instead of um, like a, a native cooperative, so to speak. Um, but in, in, in most provinces in Canada, the, um, um, there's quite a lot of flexibility in the, uh, uh, in the cooperative laws. And so, um, so my understanding, um, and, and I, I could be wrong on the exact numbers, but it's, it's something like 75% uh, of the, the directors of the cooperative um, need to reside in Canada. This is even for like a, an Ontario one. They don't necessarily need to be in Ontario. Um, and uh, but then as for the the membership as a whole, like the directors are usually like three to eight people, something like that. But the membership as a whole, which can be uh, much bigger, it, they can be from any country. So that has allowed us to pick the kind of native cooperative model because it does let us hire um, in other other countries. Um, and so that's uh, that's really helpful. But it was something we were concerned about, and it and it took us quite a while to get the cooperative. I don't know if it was. Um, just our cooperative lawyer or the system generally, but um, but yeah, these things can take a while, like um, months, may maybe even years sometimes, so it's a good thing if you want to do to, to get started early. I mean, I think Galia has had issues like this, um, but I can't speak to them, so this is not a kind of non-answer. But you know, I know I hear I hear about these things being worked on and that they have been worked on in the past, and it's just like a very interesting thing about that I think is important to point out about our society is that even um, the legal structures prefer certain kind of organizational structures, and when we are trying to have co-ops, we're constantly butting against that. Um, in fact, like, and not just co-ops, but in, in lots of areas. I mean, look at free software. We're constantly butting against laws in order to have free software. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I guess there's effort, but it's worth the effort, and we're paving the way for other people, so yeah, that's great. Yeah, I mean, my, what I'm thinking of is, I don't know if it counts as regulatory, but we, you know, we did spend a lot of time during our incorporation process uh, thinking about specifically IP because we were forming a business based around a piece of open source software that we were all contributing to and we didn't really know what any of that meant in terms of intellectual property um, and who owns what and who you know all, all that stuff that needs to be in the bylaws so that turned out to be something that we we turned to a lawyer's expertise 
on because we were out of our depths. Mm -hmm. um, but that you know that was a that was a big conversation for us as you know as people who who were organizing around free software, yeah. organizing a business. Sure. Not a legal, not a legal uh, relationship. Just kind of like, okay, you know, we helped you, so maybe in the future you could help us. Just to just to yeah, repeat thanks. for the recording, I think um, the qu question was about different classes of, of memberships, um, uh, either within the cooperative or or as different cooperatives. Yeah, so the, the comment was, um, what if folks with, like, a lot of shared interests, like sysadmins or whatever, uh, form co-ops so they could, like, collectively address problems they all share? Um, yeah, I, I, I think there are a lot of different ways that we try to do this, right? I mean, one is just by being a part of other cooperatives, right? For example, um, Agaric, we host, we try to host all of our websites on May 1st, which is a cooperative hosting service and um, as a, of course, as a member of the hosting cooperative, um, you're an owner of it and um, and then other ways, they not only do we, you know, get to host our websites there, but they also provide services like, and all free software services that is, so um, like Mumble, Nextcloud, um, they, they host their own Jitsi, there's a whole, there's a whole bunch of others, I won't, I won't go through all of them, um, but those um, that the the May first stack is a big part of our workflow, um, and so that is kind of you know an example of that. And then the other thing it, for us is our uh, the platform that we build, Drutopia. Um, one of the goals of that it hasn't actually happened, but it's been one of the goals, <laughs> which I thought would be really cool, and I'd still like to see it happen. Is for a cooperative to form around just the platform itself and, and the tool that we're building. So if there were other co-ops or other any other entities that wanted to help either use the platform and um, whether that's you know paying for usage of it to, for, to be just to be part of the cooperative and to have a, a voice in you know the direction of the platform or other developers are helping to contribute to it, um, for a cooperative to be developed around that platform um, is at least one of the things that we've said we wanted to do and, and not really made happen entirely, but it would be cool. Can, can you tell them the URL for May 1st? Sure, there's, uh, you can go to mayfirst.org or mayfirst.coop. Co-op.coop. Co-op. Co-op, yeah, mayfirst.coop. What was your question, sorry? Ah, uh, uh, gotcha, yeah, M-A-Y-F-I-R-S-T dot co-op. What do I do? You, you have, your clients are part of the American Cooperative Grocers Association. Yeah, but they're not members of our co-op. That I, I'm, I love your question. I, it was actually, I had it written down, I can prove it, that it was going to be one of my questions to you all if we had time, but I... Well, I, yeah, I mean, I, I guess to me the, it was like, are your clients, like, are your clients members? Do, you, do your clients, are they vested in your business somehow? And, and that was like, that was another thing that we were grappling with during incorporation. Like, how can we, or, or is that even a good idea? Um, and I was just curious, but I mean, that's, 
but we don't we don't have we don't have that. But yes, like I said, a lot of our clients are already co-ops. Um, but we're very niche. Okay. Um, I think that was the last question. <laughs> we're out of or time. You can, but also we have a half hour before the ending ceremony. So if you True, have nothing yeah. else to do and you want to <laughs> pester us, then... Please go ahead. I speak on behalf of everyone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we can keep going if you're having fun. Yeah. <laughs> Have you guys talked about the software you use to run the board, like do board work? Like if you have a board? So the question was, uh, can we talk about some of the software we use to do board work? Yeah, governance software. Like governance, What's, yeah. What yeah. governance software do you use? That would be like Lumio yeah. and other Yeah, yeah. so what governance software do you use for running the business? Yeah, well, um, I mean, we have a lot of softwares, and I don't know all of them. Lumio is an extremely useful software, I think, especially for a co-op of our size. Um, for voting and polls. And then we, you know, we have a wiki and we've got a bunch of Git repos and um, we track issues in a GitLab. Um, and, but also we have another support issue tracker. And well, a lot of our documentation is in Git, yeah. which is really nice because you can right. see kind of the history of why things are changing over time. And yeah, I mean, it's like what, we use today seems completely different than what they used 22 years ago and and since you yeah. know from then and now there's been like a million different iterations of different stuff to solve different problems as new applications and solutions have come out so right yeah <laughs> it's constantly changing it seems for the better i think but, but we like to use free software yeah <laughs> I don't know. What do you guys want? Uh, do you want to come back? Or yeah. <laughs> the question awesome. was, are we going to come back and uh, have another track next year and make this like an annual thing? Is there interest? I yeah. don't know. Sure. Do y'all in the audience want to hear more about this next we'll, year? Like, see. Or maybe what? start a co-op between yeah, that's now. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Will, will, will you folks start co-ops? <laughs> yeah, maybe, so yeah, maybe you could be speakers year. in our track next year. I mean, yeah. Fossey.coop. Yeah. <laughs> Go go register it now. Yeah. <laughs> or, or join join existing ones. It would be fine. <laughs> can, there's lots of ways to get involved. And the reason I ask is because then I can tell someone, you know, if they're part of a platform cooperative or that kind of thing, hey, make sure you check out this app. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I it's so important. I mean, this is just we're just barely scratching the surface of. Uh, cooperative issues in this talk right now and and in the talks that we had today and um, especially because again there's just so few examples of co-ops in the world to look to so um, I know sorry it, I'm talking about over the course of your life when you grow up you don't run into many co-ops there are many examples to look to but individually you have very little experience and intuition and I think that it's important for us to come together to to learn from each other and also come together in places where we can talk to other people and expose uh, the idea of cooperatives. Yeah, I, I wanted to ask a follow-up question that is actually to the rest of the panel since we sort of seem to keep going here. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> if I'd thought of it, I would have asked it earlier. Um, I, I feel like there's this funny intersection you know, between free software and cooperatives, and even though I'm not an expert in either one, I feel like a lot of the time when I talk to co-op people, I'm the one make, being, making noise about free software, or when I'm in software circles, I'm the one making noise about cooperatives, just in principle. And the tie-in question for other people, especially here, is um, what other conferences or connections are there or that you know of? Or they, is there a place that's not a tech conference, or not a software conference, where you go and to, to what, what, what like co-op conferences are there or things like that or spaces? I'm, not, I'm just not aware. So I wonder if other people know about these things. Is there a co-op con? Or <laughs> there's, there's so many. Mm -hmm. Really? So, yeah, yeah, can you tell us about them? I, so, so many. I mean, it's the same problem that's kind of come up throughout here where we've got a lot of stuff going on in the co-op world and none of it's really very tied together because when we're talking, because co-ops are everywhere and every, you know, it's just like, you can be off in your like little co-op 
worker co-op engineering bubble and you're only seeing and interacting with people who are engineers and co you know so you're going to engineering conferences and you're like meeting up with other co-op pe you know, people at engineering conferences or whatever that's an example but um, they're so I mean, I feel like you could have a co-op track at every single conference that ever happens. <laughs> <laughs> that's personally. Um, I go to plenty of food co-op conferences. That's the work that I do. Um, there's the, the national, the big national one there is the Consumer Co-op Management Association, the CCMA conference in June every year. But food co-ops is like a tiny piece of the co-op pie. Um, so f there's like the National Rural Telecom Association, NRTC, National Rural Telecom Co-op. Um, they, have, they have annual conferences, so, and there are thousands of people at these conferences. These are huge, you know, corporate conference. Uh, the credit unions, I haven't been to a credit union conference, but I bet they're pretty swanky. <laughs> uh, you know, so it's really like, what world are you in? What water are you swimming in? Um, and then find your people. But it does make it hard for us all to like stay unified, I think, because we're all doing, we're all cooperating, but in wildly different ways with different people. So it's nice to have, it's nice to have that cooperation among co-ops as one of our core principles. Um, it keeps us kind of focused outward, looking for each other, helping each other. Uh, this isn't necessarily about conferences, but I know, um, Agaric, we've hosted a weekly show and tell for a long time where people can just come and talk about co-ops and tech, and we're not doing that so much right now because we're using that time to work on a sort of pet development project, which is really great, and I'm really happy to see that moving forward. But if people are interested in having show and tells, we'd be happy to make sure that we do have <laughs> show and tells during that time and, and keep that going because it, it is a really great thing to have and it's really nice when people who are passionate about those things get to come together on a somewhat regular basis. On, on that note, um, I know that um, Watson and, and Volk have a book reading club, right? Is that still going on? Yeah, every for six years, every month so, book review. So, so that's... Uploaded to YouTube and everything. What? Cool. Yeah. So that's another space that I think people might might be interested, you know, and and especially if you really, I know that at the book club they really get into some pretty deep topics. Kind of, if anyone was at Watson's talk earlier, you know, he's really digging in, and uh, and that's what the book club's going to be like. So <laughs> if that's what you're into, I'd recommend that. Where do we find out more information on the the book club? That's the just Austin Software Cooperatives. If you Google that, it's a meetup.com. And uh, don't worry if you don't read the book, I mind map the whole book out, so. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Any more questions? We should probably officially right. wrap it up. Yeah, all right. Right. Yeah. Here. You know. Sweet. Well, thank you, panelists. Awesome. And I believe this is the last thing in our track. So thank you all for attending the co-op track. And yeah. let us know how we did if you want us Bounce. to come back. <laughs> for what? Um, all right. yeah. Hold that thought. I'm taking a note yeah. to, to check out the video recording of your talk. So I don't forget. <laughs> <laughs>